Imagine sending over 25 billion messages every single month. That is over 850 million messages per day or 35 million messages sent an hour or 600,000 every minute. Those numbers are absolutely bonkers. For Discord, this is just the reality of their operation. According to 2019 numbers, Discord is a place where you and friends can chat. Yeah, 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 you know, that's why you clicked on this video. Of course, if you redirected all the traffic to your measly little Chromebook, there is a possibility that it might explode. So how does Discord do this? Well, it takes an amazing team of engineers to architect a solution that can upkeep the amount of users that Discord had. A huge source of this video was found on Discord's engineering blog where co-founder and CTO Stanislav Vizhnevsky explains in detail how they store billions of messages. It's very impressive and technical. So in this video, I'm gonna be breaking it down so that even if you don't understand software solutions or engineering, you'll understand. This video isn't sponsored by the way, but Discord, if you want to maybe include my server in the partner program and send me some swag, I won't be disappointed. The way startup culture works in software is to innovate really, really fast. In order to do this, you have to use technology that lets you iterate over your product very, very quickly. Discord is no exception. When founded in 2015, Discord built the first version of their software in only two months. The tool for the job, the NoSQL database, MongoDB. Now, MongoDB is controversial for a variety of reasons. To understand why MongoDB was used and is controversial, we'll need to take a little context break about databases. Databases advantage over something like a spreadsheet is in the relation, meaning that if I wanted to store information on customers and their pets, I can create two separate tables, one customers and two pets. Whenever a customer has five pets, it won't affect the columns like it would a spreadsheet, etc. You use something called SQL to manage this. And I know haters, I say SQL because I'm just a cool dev like that. Now, the disadvantage of this is constant migrations. What happens if you need to make significant changes a couple months down the road? Well, you would have to start working with your existing database, filling out empty rows, doing merges, etc. Not easy. This is the beauty of MongoDB. It doesn't use the relation or SQL. Get it? No SQL? Crazy, right? But the trade-offs of MongoDB is being able to go super fast because of its non-structured data. You store JSON data in a document, which is just kind of like text. It doesn't have to match the migrated rows, meaning you can push a new version of your app basically instantly. Every single message in Discord was unique by the timestamp, as well as the channel that it was created on. After 100 million messages stored, MongoDB wasn't able to properly index the data and latency was becoming a huge issue. It was time to find a better tool for the job. What is going on with this light here? When searching for a new database, Discord engineers needed to take a couple things into consideration. One, read to write ratio was roughly 50-50, meaning the messages that were sent slash updated to being read were close to 50-50. Voice chat heavy Discord servers sent almost no messages. The issue with this is that when a member logs onto the server, they're going to see old messages that are no longer in the cache, causing random reads to the Discord database, meaning it was more computing power to retrieve that message. On the opposite end, private text chat servers send between 100,000 to 1 million messages a year. But since this has less than 100 members, a lot of the data isn't recent enough to be in the disk cache, which also presents another issue with random seeks to the disk as well. Large public Discord servers just send an absolute crazy amount of messages with thousands of members. We are talking about multi-million messages a year here, folks. Most of the time, they are requesting messages from the last hour, which would definitely be in the cache. <laughs> Meanwhile, I can't seem to get my app to work on my machine. Other technical things like linear scalability, automatic failover, low maintenance, and open source were almost all things that Discord was looking for. How many databases were there even to choose from? And the database chosen was... Cassandra. Cassandra, similar to MongoDB, is a NoSQL database that had great support for clustering, which means you can have multiple instances of the database working as one for more power. Big tech companies like Apple and Netflix both use Cassandra and have thousands of different nodes which run Cassandra instances. Awesome, but making the decision is the easy part. Making the actual switch, well, 
that was going to be a bit tough. With new databases comes new ways to model data. Cassandra has an interesting way of modeling data. <laughs> modeling data. That makes it sound like I know what I'm talking about, does it? Instead of a regular key value, it has a key key value, KKV for short, where both of the Ks make up the primary key, aka the unique field. For databases, a primary key is needed to help identify a single instance in a database, so you can always retrieve a single object. The first key finds the node that the data lives on and where it can be found on the disk. The second K is the clustering key, which identifies the row within the partition of the first K. Now, unlike most databases, it's important to realize that Cassandra doesn't model its data in a table-like manner. It forces you to model your data in a way that makes querying, aka getting data, much better. <sighs> okay, that was a lot to explain. I got the Cassandra docs right over here if you need them. Now comes an even scarier conversation for developers, migrating databases. When migrating over, Discord engineers realized that partition sizes shouldn't be over 100 megabytes. This was to prevent scaling issues or slowdowns from Cassandra's side. Quick aside, 100 megabytes of pure text data is actually just a lot of data. It's like seriously a lot. So they decided to group the messages by time and put them into things called buckets. They realized that around 10 days worth of messages would fit under 100 megabytes. This created another layer of abstraction, but it made it so you can easily find messages and what channel is from, the bucket it is in, and the message ID. When you load up Discord on a popular server, you're more likely wanting to grab more recent messages rather than ones that are far back so this made it much easier to scale. For servers that were not as active, it meant more searches to random buckets, but usually this just wasn't the case. Awesome. So before deploying, Discord engineer set up the Cassandra database alongside its Mongo database. Immediately after launching, there was a strange error. In the database, messages were existing without authors. How can no one send a message? That just doesn't make sense. The Discord engineers found a strange bug. In the instance where a user edits a message at the same time another user deletes that same message, it ends up deleting all the information apart from the primary key and text. Why did this happen? Cassandra is a little bit of a weirdo. Cassandra only writes data as upserts, meaning to insert a row into a database, it will update the row if it exists, or insert it if it doesn't exist. So when both happen at the exact same time, it deletes the entire row, but keeps the text that was meant to update it. <laughs> What's funny with software is that problems can only be identified when they happen at scale. Imagine not knowing the outside world for years. If you studied what was outside, you still might get hit by a bus. Discord's fix was to make the column required, as well as delete the message if it came back null, which means deleted. And this fixed the issue, but it brought over another issue. The way Discord was deleting data was massively inefficient. Here's why. Cassandra couldn't just delete data right away. What is up, Cassandra? What is up with you? It would need to replicate the deleted data to the other nodes, which could take a while. So what Cassandra does in the meantime is mark this as a tombstone, which signifies that it will be deleted during background processes. Cassandra just skips over the tombstone after reading it. Remember, reading from a database is more expensive computational-wise than to write into a database. So whenever needed, they chose to make sure they didn't have any tombstones or null values in the database. After solving those pesky little issues, performance was great. Creating a message in the database was less than a millisecond and reading was under five milliseconds. Super sonic speed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just trying to appeal to you gamers, okay? You can see how impressive this is to this day. Going to a server and then jumping to messages over a year old, blazingly fast. This is standard for users, but an incredible feat for developers. With over 150 million monthly active users, that is just completely bonkers. Some Discord channels hurt my eyes looking at them. The engineering that goes into this is just incredible. For a service we just kind of expect to work, it's cool seeing all the insane work and decisions that goes into making all this happen nicely. I just wonder how expensive it is. So it's just all one big happy ending, or is it? Six months later, Cassandra became completely unresponsive, but why? After digging around, they found that the Puzzles and Dragons subreddit public Discord server would take 20 seconds to load. Why? <laughs> How many times am I going to say why? They realized that it only had one message in it. 
What? The moderators programmed a bot using the official Discord API to delete millions of messages just to leave one. At this point, it all started to make sense. Remember when I mentioned tombstones like two minutes ago or something? When a user loaded the channel with millions and millions of deleted messages, Cassandra had to scan millions of tombstones, which would generate garbage faster than Java, what Cassandra's built on top of, was able to collect. In programming language, a garbage collection is what's used to automatically manage your memory. A lot of the time, you don't have to worry about this, unless you are, of course, collecting millions and millions of messages randomly. The solution was to lower the lifespan of how long these tombstones lasted for and change the way Discord receives messages from these buckets. So the article that I'm basing this video on came in 2017. At the time, 12 node clusters with three replicas each were being used. In the article, they reference how Netflix and Apple run hundreds of nodes and how eventually they'll get there. Funny enough, they talked about how a long-term solution for them was to look into Skyla that was written in C++, a much faster programming language. Skyla is also a Cassandra-compatible database. When you go to the Skyla website, they specifically mention powering Discord. That's for sure a flex. Tech companies move really fast, and I will 100% assume that since 2017, Discord has moved on to other tech stacks and has hired many, many more engineers that can do insane things. But this little insight from the engineering blog really helps you understand what it's like to be an engineer at a big tech company like this. What tech company would you like me to go more in depth on? I'd love to hear it. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe below for more dev and tech content. Peace out coders.